Hey everyone, it's James from 3 Pedal Special. So I got this idea to do a video on why the Nintendo 64 was so hard to develop on. A lot of people play the N64 but don't realize how difficult it actually was to create coherent and, well, fun games on it. And a lot of the complaints people have about certain graphical things or how the game plays are a product of how difficult it was to develop on. And the games that got everything right, well, this will help you appreciate them a little bit more, hopefully. N64 programmers worked their butts off to get products out the door in 6 to 12 months. This will be a basic overview of the architecture of the N64 and why it was so difficult to develop on. I'm not going to go into any massive detail here, this will just be an overview. But this will at least give you an idea of how difficult it actually was to develop on. I'm going to try and explain in embedded terms why the Nintendo 64 was particularly hard to develop on. The Nintendo 64 CPU was a special variant of the MIPSR 4300, known as the 4300i. It was a little more beefed up. It had a 24 kilobyte L1 cache and was clocked around 94 megahertz. It could perform about 125 million instructions per second and about 93.75 million floating point operations per second. The GPU, on the other hand, was what's called the Reality Coprocessor. It was also a 64-bit, and it was clocked just at 62.5. It also had microcode capabilities, so you were able to have an interface to how the GPU is accessed, and it was possible to make it more efficient than the Nintendo standard microcode that came with the device. The Reality Coprocessor was composed of two integrated processors, the Reality Signal Processor and the Display Processor. The video and audio interface both had buffers, the video the frame, and the audio the audio buffer. So video was sent to the video output through a frame buffer at a fixed time interval using a D to A. So there was a video DAC, and then audio was the same principle. There was an audio buffer sent at a specific time interval, sent through a DAC to the sound output. There were two separate DACs, one for video, one for audio. There were also some hardware features like texture mapping, anti-aliasing, Z-buffering, bilinear filtering, and surprisingly trilinear filtering. That's why Nintendo's 3D textures looked a little smoother. And there was also some level of detail management. So the peak fill rate ended up being just under 32 megapixels a second and was actually pretty good. Audio, on the other hand, was not as thought of. It was 16-bit CD stereo quality, which was fine. There were a lot of abilities to shift pitches and voices and things like that, too. And you basically had two sampling frequencies, 44.1K and 48K. Here's where things start to get a little weird. So for memory, you had 4 megabytes of RAM bus DRAM on a shared 9-bit bus that ended up peaking just around 563 megabits per second peak bandwidth. And it was upgradable to 8 megabytes with the expansion pack. So since this was a 9-bit bus, technically you got 4.5 megs and 9 megs with the upgrade, but that 9th bit was always counted for something else. So it was either for anti-aliasing or z-buffering. So the reason RAM bus was used was mainly it provided a fast bus speed for a low cost. But the challenge was that RD RAM at the time had a very high access latency. So the combination of high bandwidth and high latency meant that it was extremely difficult to opt. But I haven't even gotten to the kicker yet. Here's where things start to get strange with the architecture. So there were a few key omissions from the CPU. The MIPS R4300 did not have any localized DMA on the CPU itself. So this means that there had to be a DMA placed somewhere else. Sure enough, it was placed after the Reality Coprocessor, meaning you had to go through the RCP in order to use the DMA. This also was the same case with the RAM. So while the effective bus speed was right around 500 megabits per second, you were capped to that of the Reality Coprocessor, which was about 250. Even the, the hardware development chief of the N64, Gino Takeda, referred to this as reflective regret. He was quoted saying, quote, when we made the N64, we thought it was logical that if you want to make advanced games, it becomes technically more difficult. We were wrong. We now understand it's the cruising speed that matters, not the momentary flash of peak power. So like I explained before, while the ability is there to reach 525 megabits per second, more often than not, you're going to be stuck with that 250 because you're going to be either needing to use the DMA or RAM to store game data that needs to be used, and the audio uses the DMA all the time. You've effectively reduced your bus speed by 60%. <sighs> this is a moment for a facepalm. 
This made 64-bit operations extremely inefficient, and in regards to most cases of development, 32-bit values were used more than 64 because of this case. It just simply wasn't fast enough to process data in an efficient enough manner. This was a challenge in itself for developers. This also meant that to make the transition to the Reality Coprocessor smoother to process graphics, companies had to write their own microcode to reach some graphical capabilities that they wanted. Companies like Boss Game Studios and Rare were known to who have written their own microcode for the N64. So unfortunately, prefetching was not available as well, so you couldn't do something like a prefetch input queue to preload machine code from memory to make things faster, so this further slowed down this whole process. On the 3D graphics side, developers were a little more satisfied with the capabilities of the N64 once again. Things like anti-aliasing, z-buffering, bilinear filtering, trilinear filtering were just the start of some of the stuff that was possible. Trilinear interpolation, interpolation also known as the algorithm LERP, was able to be used due to some special hardware from Silicon Graphics, and this was cutting edge at the time. This was the best in the market. But there were some also questionable choices with graphics as well, like the 4 kilobyte texture cache, which was virtually nothing considering the 3D generating power that the N64 had. So the Reality Coprocessor was pretty interesting. It had the Reality Display Processor and the Signal Processor, the RSP and the RDP. They communicated to each other with a 120-bit internal data bus with about 1 gig a second of bandwidth. The RSP was a MIPS R4000-based 128-bit integer vector processor. This is where the microcode was programmable through. It allowed the chip's functions to be very altered from default firmware if necessary, so basically you could optimize it for different types of work. The RSP performed more transform clipping and lighting calculations. It also helped with triangle setup for collision. The RDP was used more to handle data output and, is, and also Z-buffer computation. So instead of using a more discrete sound processor like its counterpart, the PlayStation 1, the RSP performed all the audio functions. So the CPU is pretty well tasked with this in the RTOS that's on the N64, and it can play back most codecs of audio at the time, which were PCM, MIDI, MP3, stuff like that. The cool thing was you were able to theoretically use about 100 channels of PCM at the time, but the only case that was true was when all system resources were completely devoted to audio. More often than not, you'll find N64 games using 8-bit instead of 16-bit capable audio, because of the ROM cartridge format being limiting to the audio size. So the quality went down, which is why you kind of hear some rough sounding audio in N64. There were actually some extensions available or things built into the cartridges for certain games. While there were a lot of available features to use, it was difficult to create a steady workflow at first for developers to set the groundwork for how to develop games. Once that groundwork was laid, tool sets were developed, that's when you saw development speeds start to take off. But originally this was a very difficult thing. And hopefully you see why now. I know this video was kind of dense, but I hope you guys enjoyed regardless, and I hope you have a newfound appreciation for N64 developers. In the future I can go into more detail if wanted on more specifics of this development. Hi, I'm James from 3 Pedal Special. Thanks for watching my video. There will be more videos like this in the future, so if you could, please like, comment, and subscribe. I'd love to hear from the community. Who knows? You might like what I have to offer. Thanks.